it's been a couple of months, but I want to get back to the series on Satan. And if you remember, uh, prior to a couple of months ago, we spent at least a few weeks talking about the what I've called the epic war. That is the great war between God and Satan, which began in the first war in heaven. It began before, or in the first week of creation anyway, uh, when Satan led a rebellion and he took a third of the angels with him and they fought against the angels of God and they were cast out of heaven. And then the war moved on down to earth, down to the Garden of Eden. The Lord had created Adam and Eve, created them perfect and good and gave them a law. And Satan sees that this is the pinnacle of God's creation, that is man, and he formulates a plan to get rid of man, to destroy man, and that was by tempting Eve to sin and then having her then persuade Adam to sin, which he did. And Satan thought at that point, he's got the war won because God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And they ate and they died spiritually. And so he assumes he's, he's got this one licked. And then there was a wrench in the plan and God made this prophecy that, this, that the woman would have a seed and the seed of the woman would bruise Satan's head and he would bruise the seed's heel. So that set the stage for the rest of the war that there's a coming seed of the woman. There's a, a son of the woman that will be born that will eventually be Satan's undoing and Satan will fight tooth and nail to the end to prevent the seed from coming and then to destroy him once he does come. And that seed, of course, is the Messiah. So then right away... Uh, Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel, at some point, and Satan kills Abel, the righteous one. And then, uh, shortly after that, maybe not shortly, but a while after that, uh, Satan sends down the fallen angels in Genesis chapter 6, and they take on human flesh, and they mate with women, and they create these uh, giant half-breeds. They were giants and men of renown in the world. And there's, the earth is filled with violence, in the days of Noah, and the Lord destroys the earth. And so he wipes out all of, all of these half-breeds that Satan had created, all of the wicked men, and we're left with eight people again, and we're starting over at square one. Then some time passes along, and Satan builds his first world empire. It was at the Tower of Babel. And men are all of one speech, of one mind. They build this giant tower to make a name for themselves, and God comes down confounds their languages, and scatters them abroad upon the face of the earth. So once again, Satan's plans are, are ruined, and he will uh, play from that same playbook over and over again throughout history, creating one world empire after another. And we talked about that with the Egyptian empire and the Assyrian empire, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. And we'll, get, we'll talk about the Roman empire later on in this study. Then God... Um, promises that the seed will come through a specific man named Abraham. So now Satan goes after Abraham, and he gets Abraham to lie a couple of times, tries to get Abraham killed, and um, Sarah comes up with a harebrained idea that the seed that he would give, she would give Abraham her handmaid to uh, have a seed through him, which wouldn't be through the, the promised seed as God had promised with Abraham and Sarah. And yet, despite all that, Abraham has to wait 25 years, and God fructifies the loins of Abraham and Sarah, and they end up having the promised child. At a, Abraham's 100 years old, Sarah's 90. So Satan wasn't able to stop him again. Then it's promised that the seed will come through Isaac. And so then Satan goes after Isaac. And Jacob comes along after Isaac, and then it's promised that the seed will come through Jacob. So then uh, before Satan realizes that the promise was made that it would come through Judah, Jacob's son, it appears to me that Satan goes after Joseph, the favorite son of Jacob, which would be the likely candidate that the seed would come through. And he has Jacob, I'm sorry, Joseph sold into slavery into Egypt and, you know, to try to ruin his life. And through that, he ends up, Joseph ends up saving the whole nation of Israel because of the drought in the land and they all came there to live. So once again, Satan's plans are averted. But then there's the prophecy that Jacob makes at the end of his life that the scepter would not depart from Judah. So now we see that the Messiah is going to come through Judah. So then Satan knows who he's got to focus on. Well, then in the tribe of Judah, a man named David is born. And it's promised that the promised seed would come through David. So now Satan focuses his effort on David. 
And he goes after David, and he, commit, and he tempts David to commit adultery with Bathsheba, which was a death penalty, right? It should have been a death penalty. And thought he had David, and the Lord put away David's sin. And then comes Solomon, David's promised son. And Satan goes after Solomon. Outlandish women cause him to sin, and he uh, was corrupted at the end of his life, but not before he passed the baton on to his son, Rehoboam. And so now the kingdom splits in Israel in the days of Rehoboam. You get the north kingdom in Israel with ten tribes. You get the southern kingdom of Judah with two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And the Levites were down there too. So now Satan is focused on Judah. And he's focused on the kings of Judah because he knows that the scepter is going to come through Judah, that the Messiah will come through Judah. Now that brings us down to a time when Satan just about had destroyed the entire royal seed. He destroyed all the children of the king of Judah except for one. He missed one little baby boy, and through that one little baby boy was passed down the the royal lineage, and Christ was born because of that one little baby boy. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So there was a, a king in Judah, and his name was Ahaziah. And he was a wicked king. When you look back through the kings of Judah, you see that there were some good ones and some bad ones. And I forget, I did a study on the, on the books of the Bible and we looked at that at that time. And I don't remember the percentages, but there was a decent amount of good kings in Judah. Not very many good kings in Israel. For the most part, they were almost all wicked. But this particular king was wicked. His name was Ahaziah. And we read about him in 2 Kings 8, 25 through 27. 2 Kings 8, 25 through 27. It says, In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, which his name is also Joram in another place, uh, Ahaziah, the son of of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. Now this is where things get really um, complicated sometimes because, and I actually wrote this down in my Bible once I I went through everything and figured it out because it's, it's not all in one place, but this is just a side note, but Ahaziah, king of Judah, was the son of Jehoram, king of Judah. And Ahaziah, king of Israel, was the father of Jehoram, king of Israel. So go, just think about that for a second. That's why it gets really confusing, because you got Ahaziah and Joram are both kings of Israel and Judah, and in one case, one's the son of the other, and in the other case, one's the father of the other. And you start reading through here about Jehoram and Ahaziah, and you're like, well, is it Israel? Is it Judah? Is it, you know, it's all, it gets kind of confusing, but anyway... But that's how that all works, and I can give you the the scripture for that later if you're interested. But anyway, so verse uh, 26. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. This is Ahaziah, king of Judah. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. Now, if if that might ring a bell to you, Omri was the father of Ahab, right? So, So there's some intermarrying going on here because... Ahaziah's mother is the daughter of Omri, which I suppose would mean that she was the sister of Ahab. So he doesn't have exactly good blood coming from Ahab or part, part of Ahab's family. And here's what happens. Remember what it says in Proverbs, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. It says, And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, and he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. So we remember Ahab. He was one of the wicked kings of Israel, and his wife Jezebel stirred him up to uh, work all manner of wickedness. So here is this guy, Ahaziah, king of Judah, and he's a wicked king. And as we read there in verse 26, he has a wicked mother named Athaliah. Now at this time, God had raised up a king named Jehu. And Jehu was... Um, a very zealous individual, sometimes a little too zealous. And, but lo- the Lord raised him up for a purpose, and that was to take out the king of Israel. Because the king of Israel at that time was Joram, and God was tired of Joram. So he has the prophet anoint Jehu and gives him a commission to go take out Joram. Well, Joram had been, try to keep all this straight, Joram had been warring against the king of Syria. Hezael, I think was his name. He'd been warring against the king of Syria and he was wounded. And when he was wounded, 
Ahaziah, king of Judah, the guy that we're looking at here, Ahaziah goes to visit Joram, you know, to commiserate with him, I guess. And which he, you know, why is he going and visiting a wicked king of Israel, being the king of Judah? Well, whenever Jehu goes to kill Joram, he also kills Ahaziah, the king that we're looking at here. So Ahaziah ends up dead. And we read about that in 2 Kings 9 and verse 27. 2 Kings 9, 27. And when Ahaz, the king of Judah, saw this, that was that Joram was killed by Jehu, he fled by the way of the garden house. And Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up to Ger, which is by Iblium. Iblium. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. So Ahaziah, this wicked king, is now dead. And so is the king of Israel. So, this did not make Athaliah, Ahaziah's mother, very happy. When she finds out that her son was killed, she decides she's going to do some killing herself, and she goes to try to kill all the seed royal. She's going to wipe out every son of Ahaziah, which, don't ask me why, if your son was killed, you'd kill all your grandchildren, but for whatever reason, she maybe she because she's related to, to Ahab or something, and and she wants to be queen herself, which is what happens. So she kills all the baby boys with the exception of one, and that was only by accident because she didn't realize that she didn't get them all. So she wipes them all out, kills all the seed royal. And there's one little baby boy that is stolen away by his aunt and uh, from his wicked grandmother. And we read about that in 2 Kings 11, verses 1 through 2. This is the passage that I read this morning uh, for the call to worship. 2 Kings 11, 1 through 2. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. But Jehosheba, yeah, Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And I don't remember exactly how old he was, but I think he was under two years old, if I remember right. He was hidden for six years, and something comes to mind that he was eight when he was brought to the throne, but he might have even been six. He might have just been a baby. I don't remember. Anyway, very, very young. Well, obviously, he had a nurse, so he was extremely young. And she steals him away and hides him um, with the nurse, and then he ends up being hidden in the house of the Lord for uh, six years. And we'll look at that in just a second. But I want you to think about something. Who do you suppose inspired Athaliah to murder all the seed royal? Who do you suppose might have inspired her to do that? Maybe the one who was a murderer from the beginning, right? Let's look at John 8 and verse 44. John 8 and verse 44. This is one of the, there's a lot of parts of this study that it doesn't flat out say here that Satan inspired her to kill all the seed royal. But if you just put a couple things together, it's no stretch of the imagination whatsoever to see that this is what's happening here behind the scenes. In John 8 and verse 44, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's a murderer from the beginning. This is part of Satan's playbook, murder. Well, if you think about it, it has been prophesied that the Messiah is going to come through the kings of Judah. And if Satan can kill all the the seed of the king of Judah, because it's going to be passed down father to son, and I don't know if it was if it was nieces and nephews, if it was the whole family, the kids of whole, the whole family, I'm not sure, but it says all the seed royal, whatever that means. So who, anybody that could have possibly been heir to the throne, whoever that was, she killed them all. Now, if Satan could have accomplished this and got Joash too, there's going to be no Messiah come because it's going to come through the line of Judah and all the seed royal is dead. So he was within one little baby boy of preventing the Messiah from coming. Now, Joash was hid in the temple for six years and he's kept safe from Queen Athaliah by uh, Jehoiada the priest. And then Jehoiada the priest ends up crowning him king and killing Athaliah. Let's look at 2 Kings 11, 3 through 16. 
This is great because Athaliah gets what's coming to her, and this brings me much glee. 2 Kings 11, 3 through 16. It says, And he was hid in the house of the Lord six years, and Athaliah did reign over the land. Remember what it said in Isaiah 3 and verse 12? As for my people, women rule over them, and children are their oppressors. It's not a good thing when you've got a woman ruling over the land. And this is a great example of um, one such instance. In the seventh year of Jehoiada, this is Jehoiada, he's the priest. In, in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds with the captains and the guard and brought them to him into the house of the Lord and made a covenant with them and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. Nobody knew about this. For six years, he was hidden away. And all these soldiers and the government and the queen, and nobody knew that this little boy had been hidden there. And here it is. Now he's six years old, and Jehoiada is ready to have him crowned king of Israel. Let's continue. Verse 5. And he commanded them, saying, This is the thing that ye shall do. A third part of you that enter in on the Sabbath shall be keepers of the watch of the king's house. And a third part shall be at the gate, sir, and a third part at the gate behind the guard. So shall ye keep the watch of the house, that it be not broken down. And two parts of all you that go forth on the Sabbath, even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. And ye shall compass the king round about every man with his weapons in his hand. And he that cometh within the ranges, let him be slain. And be ye with the king as he goeth out and as he cometh in. So protect him. Be around him. Don't let anything happen to this little boy. And the captains over the hundreds did according to all things that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And they took every man his men that were to come in on the Sabbath with them that should go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. And the captains over hundreds did the priest give King David's spears and shields that they were uh, that were in the temple of the Lord. And the guards stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, round about the king, from the right corner of the temple to the left corner of the temple, along by the altar and the temple. And he brought forth the king's son and put a crown upon him and gave him the testimony. That's the, the word of God. Remember, the king was supposed to have a copy of that. And they made him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. And when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar, as the manor was, and the princes and the trumpeters by the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. And Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, Treason, treason! But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the host, and said unto them, Have her forth without the ranges, and him that followeth her kill with the sword. For the priest had said, Let her not be slain in the house of the Lord. And they laid hands on her, and she went by the way by the which the horses came into the king's house, and there was she slain. When you sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. When you roll a stone, it'll be rolled upon you. When you dig a pit, you will fall therein, the scripture says. And this is what happened to that wicked woman. She was killed. She got to see her grandson coronated for a brief moment before she was taken out. So Satan thought he had he had won this thing, and it gets turned around, and this little boy gets coronated, and now he's the king of Israel. He's the rightful heir of the throne, and he will be the progenitor of the Messiah. Satan's lost the battle again. Now, it was, it was bad enough that the seed royal was preserved. It was bad enough that, that we could go on for another generation and be one step closer to the Messiah. That was bad enough. But God really gets a leg up on Satan here. Because now Jehoiada has the people make a covenant with God and the king that they are going to be the Lord's people. Because they had a wicked king over them that was Joash's dad, Ahaziah, and they hadn't been with the Lord. They had turned from the Lord, and now they make a covenant to stick with the Lord. In 2 Kings 11 and verse 17, And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people, that they should be the Lord's people between the king and also, and the people. 
So talk about insult to injury. Now the people have a renewed zeal and covenant for the Lord, right? So now Satan is down a peg, but it gets even better than that. Then the people of Judah, in their zeal, they go and break down the house of Baal and they kill the priest of Baal. So they eliminate false religion in the land. They eliminate Satan's religion in the land. Satan tries to destroy the royal line of the king of Judah and now he ends up having the people turn back to God and have his own religion in the land destroyed. Verse 18, And all the people of the land went into the house of Baal and break it down, his altars and his images, break they in pieces thoroughly and slew Matin the priest of Baal before the altars and the priest anointed officers over the house of the Lord. So now you have the house, you have the, 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 uh, the temple of Baal is destroyed and now they anoint officers over the house of the Lord because apparently that had gotten lax too and the house of the Lord has not been taken care of. Then Joash ends up being the king of Israel and a good king for 40 years. And he led the effort to repair the house of the Lord. Like I said, it had gone into disrepair and he leads that effort. So first of all, he's on the throne now and he reigns for 40 years. We're told in 2 Kings 12, 1 through 2. It says, he was seven years old there in verse 21 of the previous chapter. Seven years old when he began to reign. So he would have been a year old uh, whenever he was taken and hidden in the temple because he was there for six years and seven whenever he was... um, crowned king. Anyway, so 2 Kings 12 and verse 1, in the seventh year of Jehu, Joah, in the seventh year of Jehu, Joahash, and let me just, let me say something here. So Jehoash, is how you pronounce that, Jehoash is another name for Joash. So whenever you see Joash or Jehoash, that's the same name. That's another difficulty when you're reading through the Old Testament and you get all these kings and they go by these different names, like uh, Isaiah and um, what was Isaiah's name? He had another, I think Amaziah and Isaiah, or I can't remember. Anyway, there was a guy that he had a couple of different names too, which it's, it's escaping me right now. So anyway, in the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash began to reign and 40 years reigned he in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. It's good for a king if he has good spiritual counsel because he had a spiritual counselor here, uh, Jehoiada, and he was a good king, reigned for 40 years and did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And he leads the effort to repair the temple, which was the house of God in those days, which was kind of the the uh, the the uh, uh, the other side of the church, if you will, um, in the it was the counterpart of the church of the New Testament was the temple where the church met in the Old Testament. Let's read about that in Second Kings uh, twelve verses four through sixteen. Here's another finger in Satan's eye because talk about it all backfiring. Now the house of God gets rebuilt. Now the the religion of God gets put back in its proper place. Verse 4, 2 Kings 12, 4. And Jehoash said to the priest, All the money of the dedicated things that is brought into the house of the Lord, even the money of every one that passeth the account, the money that every man is set at, and all the money that cometh into any man's heart to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priest take it to them, every man of his acquaintance, and let them repair the breaches of the house wheresoever any breach shall be found. But it was so that in the three and twentieth year of King Jehoash, the priest had not repaired the breaches of the house. So a long time goes on, and they've been collecting this money, but they haven't been doing anything with it. They haven't been fixing up the house yet. Then King Jehoash called for Jehoiada the priest and the other priests, and said unto them, Why repair ye not the breaches of the house? Now therefore receive no more money of your acquaintance, but deliver it for the breaches of the house. And the priest consented to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. But Jehoiada the priest took a chest and bored a hole in the lid of it and set it beside the altar on the right side as one cometh into the house of the Lord. And the priest that kept the door put therein all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. I I really, I think this is really neat. This is basically what we do as a church with the church box or the pastor box, 
we have, you know, he, he basically took a, a, a box, bored a hole in it, and people threw the money in it. And I think it's neat because that's basically what we do. Most churches pass the plate around to make everybody feel guilty, and you've got to throw something in there because you don't want to look like the guy that didn't put anything in the box. And, but we just set it over in the corner like they did back there, and people put money in it when they want to. So I think that's pretty neat. Verse 10. And it was so when they saw that there was much money in the chest that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and they put up in bags and told the money. That means they counted it. They told the money that was found in the house of the Lord. And they gave the money being told into the hands of them that did the work that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they laid it out to the carpenters and builders that wrought upon the house of the Lord. Now, here's a novel idea. These people actually saved up money for a building project and then built with money that they already had saved. They didn't go down to the bank and take a big loan out to build a church building or something. They saved the money and then built the building. And I know churches that have done that before. I, I believe the church up in Mesick, Dr. Townsend's church, they, they have their own building and they actually saved the money and laid out the cash and built it. I think that's a good idea. Anyway. And to masons and hewers of stone, to buy timber and hewed stone, to repair the breaches of the house of the Lord, for all that was laid out of the house to repair it. Howbeit there were not made for the house of the Lord bowls of silver, snuffers, basins, trumpets, any vessels of gold or vessels of silver of the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the workmen and repaired therewith the house of the Lord. I guess if I had to comment on that, they weren't so uh, concerned with all of the things that might make it look a little prettier with all the gold and the silver and the, the different ornaments and that kind of thing. They were mainly concerned with getting the thing fixed up, getting the structure of it fixed, whatever the breaches were, get this fixed up, get the, get the, get the structure set up. And then we can worry about all that other stuff later. But the important thing is to get the church fixed up and repair the breaches. And that's what every church should focus on. Don't focus on all the other uh, superficial stuff, but focus on getting the breaches fixed up. But they gave to the workmen and repaired therewith the house of the Lord. Verse 15, Moreover, they reckoned not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be bestowed on the workmen, for they dealt faithfully. They didn't even have to worry about it. They knew these guys were not going to, they weren't, skimming money off the top. They didn't have to reckon with them. They didn't have to go and verify and check and make sure everything was done right. Those guys were being faithful. The trespass money and sin money was not brought into the house of the Lord. It was the priests. So it was kind of a lengthy reading, but I wanted to show you that look at the zeal that Joash ended up inspiring in the people to rebuild the church of God, right? To get the breaches repaired and get it in good shape. And all this was a result of Satan trying to wipe out the entire royal seed. Isn't that neat? I think that's pretty neat. It totally backfired on him. The Lord, the, the people are the Lord's people. Baal is destroyed and the house of God is fixed up. But if that's not enough, Joash is then succeeded by a few more good kings who reign over Judah for another 97 years. Let me show you that after, Joash, after Joash's death. In First King, Second Kings, fourteen one through three, so not only was Joash a good king, but there's three kings after Joash that are all good kings. And remember, prior to that, his dad was a bad king. So Satan wipes out a bad king, and then ends up getting four good kings in a row. Isn't that interesting? Second Kings, fourteen one through three. It says, in the second year of Joash, son of Jeho- uh, Jehoahaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. And he reigned tw- uh, twenty and five years old. Uh, I'm sorry, and he was twenty and five years old when he began to reign, and reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jeho- uh, Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did according to all things as Joash his father did, like father, like son. In this case, Joash passed down a good inheritance, a good godly spiritual inheritance to his son. Maybe not as good as David, but he still did a pretty good job. And then you got the next one in line in 2 Kings 15, 1 through 3. So that was Amaziah after Joash. And then you have a guy named Azariah. 
2 Kings 15, 1 through 3. It says, In the twenty and seventh year of, Je- of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Sixteen years old went uh, was he when he began to reign, and he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem. That's a long time, fifty-two years. And his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. So now you, it's a generational thing. Joash brought up Amaziah right. Amaziah brought up Azariah right. And they've passed the faith on from father to son. That's the way it's supposed to work. And then one more, 2 Kings 15, 32 through 34. 2 Kings 15, 32 through 34. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah. That's who I was talking about earlier. Uzziah and Azariah are the same guy. So uh, uh, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done, or Azariah. So you got four generations there of good kings. So as a result of Satan's attack on the bloodline of the kings of Judah through Athaliah, Judah had good kings reigning over them for 137 years. That is Joash, Amaziah, Azariah, and Jotham. Good things for good kings and things for 137 years. So talk about Satan's plan backfiring. When he thought that he had the whole royal line wiped out, he got four good kings in a row for 137 years. He was within one baby boy of, presenting the, of preventing the Messiah from being heir to David's throne. And his plan totally backfires, and he's lost yet another battle. Now, there was a lot of other things that happened in the rest of the history leading up to the birth of Christ. And I'm not going to cover that in great detail. I'll just briefly mention it here. But So, Judah was in good shape there for a while. And then they did get some bad kings. And then they got some good kings again. Hezekiah, uh, Josiah, some of those guys were really good kings. And they went back and forth between good kings and bad kings. And then eventually they got some bad kings and they did so bad under Manasseh that it says that the wrath of the Lord arose until there was no remedy. And he ended up destroying the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. And he sent in King Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonians, and they destroyed Jerusalem. And they carried off most of the Jews to Babylon. And for 70 years they were in Babylon and Jerusalem lie in heaps. It was just destroyed and ruined. There was just a few people left there to left, left there to till the fields, and that was about it. So at this point, it's looking like Satan's got a leg up. Jerusalem's destroyed. The temple's destroyed. There's really no king of Judah anymore. There's still a royal line, but nobody's really, nobody's king of it. I think Nebuchadnezzar did leave somebody kind of in charge there, a governor of it. I forget the, the king's name, uh, who that was. But there's really no nation to be a king of at that time, so that, that's looking pretty good for Satan. But then 70 years later, they come back and they rebuild. They re- rebuild Jerusalem, the city, and the temple. And then there's about a 400-year period of, I don't, I don't think really Israel was autonomous at that time, as far as I know. Um, the kingly line continued, father to son, but I'm not, I could be wrong, and if I am, you correct me if you find out or something, but I don't think there was really much of a king of Israel, or if it was, it wasn't recorded. We weren't really told much about the kingdom of Israel or the kingdom of Judah at that time. Um, there was pretty much an end to prophecy also. There was about 400 years there after the prophecy of Zechariah and Malachi when there was no uh, prophetic word given and things were just kind of quiet for about 400 years. There's just not much going on, no word from the Lord. Satan's not really getting much information. Um, But at this time, he's planning and scheming and he knows when the Messiah is going to be born. And he knew that because, I'll get into into this in just a second, but he can read the Bible just like we can. And he could read the prophecies, and he could figure out, I, I'm sure, being as smart as he is, he could figure out that when, about when Christ is going to be born. So he's got all this time to prepare, and to prepare the land of Israel to be totally corrupted 
by the time Christ comes to try to prevent Christ from coming and to destroy him. Not to mention, another thing that was in Satan's favor is whenever Israel goes to Babylon, that's whenever they come up with what eventually became written down as the Babylonian Talmud, which is the religious book of the so-called Jews today. They don't, they don't use this book. They don't use the Old Testament of this book. Everybody thinks, oh, the Jews are the ones that believe the Old Testament. No, they don't. And it's not just that they don't believe it. It's not like they read it and they don't believe it. They don't read it. They, they, I, I have been reading a book right now, and, and you're going to hear about this later in this, in this series, but they don't even read it. They say that he that reads the Torah, the, old, the five books of Moses, is okay, but the one that studies the Talmud, this is the real, the spiritual one. This is the one that's really blessed of God. And their religion is based on the Talmud, which is the oral law that was supposedly given to Moses on Mount Sinai. God gave the written law to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments and all the other laws, they also say that God gave him an oral law which was passed down from person to person and the Pharisees were the ones that had the oral law. You remember when Jesus condemned the Pharisees for their traditions? They make the word of God of none effect through their traditions. That was the oral law that the Pharisees were teaching. That oral law was written down in something called the Mishnah, which is the beginning, the part of the Talmud. And then the rest of the Talmud was written down centuries later by different rabbis. And it, it's a whole bunch of commentary. And, and basically, words multiply to, to tell you that the Old Testament doesn't mean what it said. And twist it and turn it and distort it and ruin it and rest it. That's what the whole so-called Jewish religion is about today. And that all started in Babylon. And it's called, this is not my name for it, it is the official name for it is the Babylonian Talmud. That's what it's called. They got it in Babylon. So Satan was able to get a leg up in the fight whenever Israel was in Babylon because that was um, that's where they got all their traditions. Anyway, you're going to hear more about that later, so I won't say anything else about that at this time. So, fast forward 400 years, and now it's the time when Christ is going to be born. And now the battle intensifies, because now we're finally to showtime. This is really where the, this is where the rubber meets the road, because it was prophesied that the seed of the woman would come. He's going to bruise Satan's head. Satan's going to bruise his heel. And now it's time for Christ to come. So despite all the assaults of Satan against the nation of Israel in general and the royal lineage of Judah in particular, the Messiah was born as prophesied. But let's first look at some of the events leading up to that. And let's look at the environment of Israel leading up to that. So Satan knows the scripture. And it's reasonable since he knows the scripture to conclude that he would have known the approximate date of Christ's birth. First of all, let me show you that Satan knows the scripture. Look in Matthew chapter 4. In verse 6. I just want to show you that he knows the Bible just like we do. As a matter of fact, he probably knows the Bible better than we do. He might not have an understanding of it better than we do because he probably doesn't study it the way the Bible says to study it because he doesn't want to do what God says. But chances are, being a very intelligent, highest order of creation, he probably has the thing memorized a lot better than you or I do. But being so smart and having it memorized he knows how to rest it and twist it and use it in improper ways against us. And this is what he did to Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 6. This is whenever Satan was tempting Jesus. And it says there, And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast, down, cast thyself down. That's when he had him up at the pinnacle of the temple. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. He's quoting there from Psalm 91. He knows the Bible. Of course, he was misusing the Bible, and Jesus corrected him in the next verse and rebuked him. But the point is, he knows the Bible. And if he knows the Bible, he can open his Bible up to uh, Daniel chapter 9, just like we can, which we'll do right now, and he could have figured out about the time when Christ is going to be born. Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27. This, a lot of prophecies are pretty, pretty vague. They're uh, pretty hard to, to decipher. They're written in, in language that is allegorical and that is symbolic. And a lot of times it's really hard to figure it out until after it happens. But I'll tell you what, this prophecy here, I mean, you could have read this prophecy and with just a little bit of reasoning, and a little bit of comparative study in the Old Testament itself, you could very easily have figured out about the time when Christ is going to come. And I'll read it to you and I'll show you. 
Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Here's the prophecy to Daniel. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, that's the people of Israel, and upon thy holy city, that's Jerusalem, to finish the transgression. They had a lot more sinning to do before this is going to be over. And to make an end of sins, Christ is going to put away their sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity, Christ is going to reconcile them in God. And to bring in everlasting righteousness, that's eternal salvation that Christ will wrought on the cross. And to seal up the vision and prophecy, there's going to be no more prophecy after Christ comes and inspires his, his apostles to write down the final revelation of God. That's going to be it. Okay. Now, they might not have understood all that, but anyway, I'm just kind of giving you commentary as I'm reading through it. To seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Know ye therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, In three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Okay, so he says, know therefore and understand. That tells me that we can know it and that we can understand it. And they could have known it and understood it at the time. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Jerusalem lie in ruin at this time. This is during the time of the Babylonian captivity when Daniel is writing. Daniel is one of the captives. Daniel is in Babylon during the captivity writing of the prophecy of the coming of Christ. Okay, so Jerusalem is right now destroyed. There's going to be a time when a commandment is going to go forth to restore and build Jerusalem. That's plain. Anybody can can see that from that text. So there's going to be a time whenever there's a command given for Jerusalem to be restored. From the time of that commandment given unto Messiah the Prince, this is the Messiah that's going to come, this is the seed of the woman, from that time is going to be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So let's add it up. Three score, that's 60, right? Three twenties, that's 60. And two weeks is 62 weeks. And seven weeks is 69 weeks. 62 plus 7. 69 weeks. Now, 69 weeks is just a little over a year. Now anybody that's was reading this prophecy, and then when, the, when the, the decree comes from King Cyrus to go back and build Jerusalem, they're reading this prophecy, they might have concluded, oh, well, it's going to be a little over a year, and Messiah's going to be here. Well, a little over a year comes and goes, and Messiah's not here, right? So then you go back to the drawing board, and you say, hmm, what could the 69 weeks be? Well, this is prophecy, and a lot of times in prophecy, things are not just spelled out just in, in fine detail, and sometimes allegorical language is used. Okay, well, maybe this could be weeks of years. Well, that's reasonable, right? Because didn't God make Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years a day for a year, right? They, they, they went and they spied out the land for 40 days, and they came back and didn't want to go into the land. So God tells them, that's all, all right, for a year for a day, then you're going to wander for 40 years. So in the Bible, it's very easy to look back and see that God sometimes speaks of years as days, right? So here you go. A week would be seven days or seven years. Okay, so you could say 69 weeks of years, 69 seven-year periods. 69 times seven is 483, right? So here you have 483 years from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah comes, 483 years. So whenever King Cyrus gave the command uh, to rebuild the city, just count out the number, count out the years. 483 years later, Messiah is going to come. Now, they might not have known that whether this is when he's going to be born or when he's going to appear as a, as a man or what. They might not have known that, but you know what? You could have known it within a, you know, a generation of time, within 20, 30 years. You pretty much would, be, would know when, when the Messiah was going to come. <clears throat> Let's keep reading here. Verse 26, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So you have seven weeks. In the seven weeks, there would have been 49 years. I assume that was the time that it took to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple and get all that done. So the, the, the time was broken up. The, the 69 weeks was broken up into seven weeks and then 62 weeks. So you got seven weeks to get the temple rebuilt and the, and the city rebuilt. Then after three score and two weeks after that, Messiah is going to be cut off. This is at the end of the 69th. This is the 69th week but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And 
unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with one week. This is Messiah the Prince. He's going to confirm the covenant with, with them for one week. So you got seven years, he's going to confirm the covenant. And in the midst of the week, midst of the seven years, three and a half years, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. The sacrifices are going to cease after that time, after three and a half years. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Abomination, desolation. Even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So you got him com- confirming the covenant for one week, for seven years. In the midst of that week, after three and a half years of ministry, he's going to be cut off. He's going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's when Christ died, after three and a half years of ministry. The other three and a half years officially ended at the destruction of Jerusalem. There was, uh, the way that I think it makes most sense, is that there was an, an official end and a practical end. Officially, God was done with Israel after that seven years, when, after Christ, seven years after Christ began his ministry. The, the gospel went to the Gentiles, and he's done with Israel. But then there was a practical end at 70 AD when God gave him another 40 years, another 40 years of repentance, and when they didn't do that, then Jerusalem's destroyed. So there's an official end and a practical end is the way that I explain that. But anyway, maybe someday I'll preach on this in more detail. But the part that I really wanted is that it's going to be 483 years from the time the commandment goes to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah comes. So Satan, if, if, if a Jew could figure out at that time, Satan could have figured that out. And it seemed like whenever you look in the New Testament that people in Israel were awaiting the Messiah to come. Like they thought the Messiah was going to be coming soon. Um, was it uh, Simeon in the temple, I think, whenever he found out that Christ was born, he said, now I can die. He took him up in his arms. It's like they were, they were expecting it, right? The people were in expectation. And I imagine the reason for that was they had this prophecy and they knew it's going to be some time. He's going to be coming pretty soon. And they were waiting for him to come. And so was Satan. So therefore, Satan was waiting to devour him as soon as he was born. Look at Revelation 12. 1 through 5. Revelation 12, 1 through 5. So Satan knows approximately when he's coming. And by the way, that 483 years, that would have been when Christ arrived at his public ministry. Not when he was born, but whenever he entered uh, the spotlight there in Israel, whenever he was revealed to Israel as the Messiah, that was the 483 years, not, not the time he was born. But anyway, So we go here to to Revelation 12 and verse 5, and we see something interesting. Revelation 12 and verses 1 through 5. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and Ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child. As soon as it was born, he's waiting for the child to be born to to destroy him. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. I don't think it takes a whole lot of, of figuring to realize that this is a prophecy of the first coming of the Messiah. The woman that brought him into the world is not speaking of Mary, though she was his mother. It's speaking of Israel. It's speaking of the church. The church is the woman that brought Christ into the world because Christ came through the nation of Israel. And Satan here is waiting for the child to be born to destroy him. So what Satan ends up doing is that he unleashes the power of darkness at the time, around the time when Christ was to come. It's like he wants to fill the world, fill Israel, not the world, fill Israel with all of his devils and to get that place as prepared as he can to prevent the Messiah from coming or to destroy the Messiah when he does come. And I just want to show you some things here. First of all, Jesus said to the Pharisees that this was their hour And they were of their father, the devil. So it's Satan's hour and the power of darkness. This is whenever he was being crucified. Look at it, 
Luke chapter 22 in verse 53. Luke 22 in verse 53. This really starts, I mean, this study to me just really made a lot of things in the Bible make sense. Whenever you see it from this angle and you start realizing, like, why was it that Israel was so possessed with devils in the first century? Because you read about, I'm going to show you, you read about devil possession all over the place. Why is that? We don't see devil possession like that today. At least I don't. I mean, maybe in some, in Haiti or some parts of the world like that. But we don't see that generally. But in Israel, it was rampant all over the place. Jesus was casting out devils all the time. Why is that? Well, this makes sense of it to me. Look at Luke 22 and verse 53. Luke 22, 53. Jesus says, When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. They were under the power of Satan at that time. This was his time. I I was going to say to shine, but it's darkness, so... Whatever. This was his time to darken, I suppose you could say, which doesn't sound nearly as good as time to shine. So it was prophesied that there would be sorcerers in Israel that God would judge at the time of Christ. Sorcerers, that is satanic, occultic religion. And this was prophesied in the book of Malachi. Malachi 3 and verse 5. God saw this one coming. He knew what, it was, what the times were going to be like when, when Christ came. Malachi 3.5, he says, And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling of his wages, the widow and the fatherless, that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. The first one he's going to be against is the sorcerers of Israel. Now, this is speaking of the first coming of Christ, and I will show it to you by reading the first five verses of that chapter, leading up, first four verses, leading up to verse five. You'll recognize these verses, I'm sure. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. I'll send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. We know that's John the Baptist, right? We read about that in several places in the New Testament. <clears throat> it's funny, I don't know if you've ever listened to uh, the symphony Handel's Messiah, but it's taken right from the Bible. Pretty much every, almost every word of that whole symphony is taken from the Bible. It's all prophecies of the coming of Christ. And this is one of the, this passage is one of the songs in that symphony, and every time I read it, I, I, I hear the symphony, the words of the symphony going in, in my mind. Let's keep reading here. <clears throat> but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and, the, and like fuller's soap. He's going to burn off the chaff with unquenchable fire, right? He's going to purify people. He's going to burn off the wood, hay, and the stubble. And he's like the fuller soap. He's going to wash his people with the washing of water by the word. Isn't that neat? And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And then he says, I'm going to destroy the sorcerers. So this is clearly the first coming of Christ and there are going to be sorcerers in the land that God is going to destroy. This is satanic religion. Now let me just give you some verses to show you that Israel was full of devils at that time. Let's look at Matthew 8 and verse 16. Matthew 8 and verse 16. Just going to give you a, a list of them here. Just read them quickly. But I just want to show you the length and breadth and depth and height of the, of the satanic the, 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 the satanic influence in the nation of Israel at that time. And I don't think this is coincidental. I don't think at all. I think there was a reason why this place is full of devils. Because he was preparing an environment for Christ to be born where he could oppose him uh, at the best that he could. Matthew 8 and verse 16. 
It says, when, even, when the even was come, they brought unto him, that is unto Jesus, many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Brought many that were possessed with devils, it says. Let's go over to Mark 1 and verse 13. Mark 1 and verse 13. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan. That's not the verse I was looking for. What was I looking for? Mark 1, 23. Pardon me. Mark 1, 23. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. I'll get back to verse 24 in a minute. But here's this man with an unclean spirit. Actually, he had more than one of them because it says, let us alone. You remember the man with the legion. He had a whole legion of spirits within him. This man had more than one, it sounds like. Mark 3 and verse 11. Mark 3 and verse 11, it says, And unclean spirits, when they saw him, that is when they saw Jesus, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. There's a lot of people that say Jesus is Lord, right? Thou art the Son of God. Even devils say that. They're not going to submit to him, though. To acknowledge the fact is one thing. To submit to the fact is another. Look at Mark 5, 2, 8, and 9. Mark 5, verses 2, 8, and 9. It says, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And then verses 8 and 9 For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Many. A legion was uh, 10,000, I think. I think a legion is 10,000, if I remember right. So, I mean, you can imagine what a bad day you'd be having if you had 10,000 devils in you. It'd be bad enough to have one. But imagine having 10,000. This is what I'm saying. Satan was really working overtime here to fill this nation full of devils. Look at Mark 7 and verse 25. Mark 7 and verse 25. It says, For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. And then even after Christ died, the the world, Israel, and and even out into the world were still full full of devils. If you look in Acts 5 and verse 16, Acts 5 and verse 16, It says, And there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. So you still had these unclean spirits in the days of the apostles, shortly after the resurrection of Christ. And I'll give you one more in this one, and that's Acts 8 and verse 7. Acts 8 and verse 7. It says, For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. <clears throat> so there was a lot of devil possession. Jerusalem and Israel in general was a haven for devils at that time. Now the devils knew who their enemy was. Remember we saw that in Mark 1 and verse 24 when Jesus went to cast him out and the devil said, Hey, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of Israel. And he was afraid of him. They knew who the enemy was. <clears throat> They were powerless against him. It didn't really do much good for Satan to fill Jerusalem with devils whenever Christ had such power over them. But I guess if you put yourself in Satan's shoes, do you know that the seed of the woman, do you know that he's God manifest in the flesh, that he has power over devils and he can cast them out? I don't know what Satan knew. So regardless of what he knew, he was using his best method that he could. Right? I've got all these devils. I'm going to use them to the best of my ability. And we'll see what we can accomplish, which, you know, they did accomplish to crucify him, which was their undoing and ultimately their destruction. So we'll get to that later. But Mark 3, Mark 1, pardon me, 23 through 24. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. So they knew. They knew who he was. They knew he was the Messiah. They knew he was going to destroy them. 
Maybe Satan knew it too, but he didn't care. It's kind of like you know throwing the troops out on the front line. You know they're going to get massacred, but you throw them out there anyway, right? Maybe that's what he was doing. I don't know. Now, the wicked Jewish leaders, they had made a covenant with death and with hell. And this was prophesied of back in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 28, 14 through 18. And this was speaking of New Testament times. So there was a time, and I'm not sure exactly when this happened, but at some time prior to the coming of Christ, the leaders of the Jews had made a covenant with the devil. And this is not some some tinfoil, tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy or something. This is Bible. This is what happened. Look at uh, Isaiah 28, verses 14 through 18. Isaiah 28, 14 through 18. <clears throat> you see, they were willing, at least the leadership, were willing accomplices in this. You know, I, I preached that sermon on Hollywood and talked about all those people that made a deal with the devil. This is as old as the hills. The, the, the leaders of the Jews were making deals with the devil way back 2,000 years ago. Isaiah 28, 14 through 18. It says, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people, which is Jerusalem. See, this is the rulers of Jerusalem, the same people that crucified Christ. This is them. Be, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. And boy, doesn't that describe the Jews and describe Satan, the father of lies, who is the father of the reprobate Jew. They've made lies their refuge. And we'll get into that. I'll give you some quotes from the Talmud. But those people are the leadership, the rabbis, are liars, total liars. It's unbelievable. But anyway, so this goes way back. They made a covenant with death and they were in agreement with hell. And who is the Lord of death and hell? Satan. Right? This is the covenant with the devil. They think by making this covenant with the devil, when the overflowing scourge comes through the land, they're not going to be harmed. They think Satan's going to protect them. That's a foolish bargain right there. Because when you make a deal with the devil, he will only use you as long as you're useful to him. And when the overflowing scourge comes through, <laughs> that covenant is null and void. And you're toast. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. This is why I say this was speaking of at the time of the coming of Christ. Because this verse right here, you probably recognize, is a prophecy of Christ and was attributed to Christ in the New Testament on, in numerous places. He is the chief cornerstone. Remember, you, you, I'm sure you are familiar with that verse. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness shall be the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. And they were... Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. They were massacred, killed, or taken captive into all nations. There wasn't a single living soul left in Jerusalem after the Romans got done with them. They plowed Jerusalem like a field. Their covenant with death and hell was disannulled. But this is what's happening whenever Christ comes. The leadership has made a deal with the devil, a covenant with the devil. They are possessed with devils. Jesus said that that generation of Jews were possessed with devils. And I'll give you the verse right now. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 43 through 45. Jesus wasn't just dealing with guys that you know, he kind of got under their skin and they were just a little mad at him. He's dealing with devil-possessed men, devil men who were in a covenant with Satan. These are wicked, wicked men that he was dealing with here. Matthew 12, 43 through 45. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus 
teaching here. He walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then he then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. I'll save the rest of the verse for just a second. So here, what is it? What is he teaching? You got a man that's possessed with an unclean spirit, a devil. The devil goes out of him for some reason. He just figures maybe he can find greener pastures somewhere else. And he walks around, he finds dry places. He didn't find any better place than the guy that he was once inhabiting. Whenever he left there, he comes back and he finds the guy empty, swept, and garnished. There's nothing that has taken the place of that devil. You see, whenever you get rid of satanic influence in your life, you need to adopt godly influence. You need to replace lying with truth-telling. You need to replace stealing with labor. You need to, you know, you need to replace corrupt communication with good communication, right? That's what Paul taught in Ephesians chapter 4. This guy's replaced it with nothing. He is void inside. He's empty. And the devil says, hey, looks like a good place to take up shop. He takes seven other devils more wicked than himself, and they inhabit that man, and the last state is worse than the first. Is Jesus just telling a story here to just... Uh, you know, just because it sounds neat? Or is he maybe teaching us a lesson about something? Let's finish the verse. Even so, it shall be also unto this wicked generation. Jesus is describing his generation, the Jewish people living at that time, the reprobates among them, as the man that the devil went out of and then came back with seven more wicked than himself and inhabited them. And those people were full of devils. This explains why they were so wicked, why they hated Jesus Christ so much, why they colluded with the Romans to put him to death and crucify and murder him. They hated him. He exposed them for what they were. Children of the devil. Now the Pharisees were pretending to cast out devils by the power of God. And this is a good cover. I mean, hey, if you're possessed with devils yourself and you can put on a show and, and have the devil like this guy did that Jesus was talking about when he goes out of the man, if you can have one of your buddies leave a man to make it look like you cast him out, that's a good cover, right? Because then how can you be possessed with devils if you're casting out devils, right? This is what they were doing. Let's look in Matthew 12 and verse 27. Matthew 12, 27. Jesus said, And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. You see, the children of the Pharisees were casting out devils. And I'll give you an example of that in the book of Acts in just a second. What they were saying is, what, what I think is that, that the Pharisees weren't actually able to cast out devils. Their sons weren't actually able to cast out devils, as I will show you in Acts 19 in just a second. It was a ruse. It was a show. They were making it look like they were casting out devils. And then they were accusing Jesus of casting out devils by the devil when they're the ones that are possessed with the devil that are making it look like they're casting out devils. But let me show you what I'm talking about here. Acts 19. Acts 19, 15, or 13 through 15. This is why I say I don't think that they were actually casting them out. I think you actually have to have the Spirit of God and the power of God to cast out a devil when men had that gift in those days. I don't believe we have that anymore. Acts 19, 13 through 15. It says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew. Remember he said, whom, By whom do your children cast them out? They're sons of a Jew, right? They're children. And chief of the priests which do so. And the evil spirit answered and said, I love this, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? They say, by the name of Jesus whom Paul preacheth, come out of there, you unclean spirit. And the unclean spirit says, I know who Jesus is, and I know who Paul are, but I don't know who you are, and I, you have no power over me whatsoever. Because when a wicked man tries to use the name of Jesus, it is ineffectual. A wicked person calling on you, using the name of Jesus to try to do something is not going to get anywhere. Jesus is not just some you know, some person at your disposal, he just do whatever you tell him to or something. That's not how it works. So this is why I say that they weren't, they really didn't have the power to cast out devils. Because if they really had the power to cast out devils, they wouldn't have been trying to use Jesus' name. Because they see the apostles doing it with Jesus' name and they think, ah, maybe we can actually do this instead of pretending to if we use Jesus. 
didn't work. Let me just show you some other examples, though. You got a guy named Simon. He was a Jewish sorcerer that bewitched the people of Samaria. Look at Acts 8, 9 through 11. Acts 8, 9 through 11. Israel was full of devils at this time. Acts 8, 9 through 11. It says, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. God said he's going to cast out the sorcerers. Well, here Simon is... He hears the gospel and he's converted. I put that in quotes, converted, supposedly, and baptized. And then he sees that the Holy Holy Ghost is given by the apostles laying their hands on people, and he wants a piece of that. He says, hey, I'll give you money. Give me this power to give the Holy Ghost to somebody. Peter says, thy money perish with thee, there in verse 20, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. So here, this guy, his heart wasn't right. He didn't have part or lot in it. He was a false convert. And why I say he was Jewish is because this is in Acts chapter 8. The gospel had not gone to the Gentiles until Acts chapter 10. No Gentiles having the gospel preached to him yet. This guy here is a Jew. He's doing it in Samaria, so maybe he's a half-breed Jew. The Samaritans were kind of, sort of Jews. They were partly Jews and, and partly not. But uh, because the king of Assyria had brought in his own people into Samaria way back whenever he took over the northern kingdom and, and mingled his people with the Jews, so they weren't exactly full-bred Jews. But anyway, this guy was a Jew of some sort, and he was a sorcerer. But he's not the only one. There's another guy named Elymas, which also went by bar He was also a sorcerer, and he resisted the preaching of the gospel. See, he wasn't trying to put on a show like uh, Simon was. This guy was outright trying to uh, oppose Paul. Acts 13, 6 through 11. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Bar-Jesus, I assume, means son of Jesus. Simon Bar-Jonah, right? Son of Jonah. Um, So this is obviously not Jesus Christ. There were other people called Jesus in that day. We read about other, there's another guy named Jesus in, in the Bible as well. But anyway, here, his name is uh, Bar-Jesus. Uh, he, is, um, he goes by several names here. So anyway, his name is uh, Elymas. We'll get to that in just a second. Verse 7, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. See, Satan is trying to resist Jesus Christ, resist the faith of Christ, resist the gospel of Christ by way of these demonically devil-inspired people. Then Saul who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. So, there you have it. You got another guy that was possessed of a devil that uh, Paul put a mist and a darkness upon. And it's interesting that people here that are children of the devil are said in Second Peter or Jude that the mist of darkness is reserved forever for them. So this guy just got a taste of the world to come for him. And then one more example. Paul enc- encountered a damsel, a young lady, that was possessed with a spirit of divination there in Acts 16, 16 through 18. I'm just showing you the vastness of the devil possession in Israel at that time. And in, in, this isn't even in Israel. This is spread out beyond Israel now. Acts 16, 16 through 18. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. 
The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So there you have three examples there of people that were possessed with spirits, or um, sorcerers, and things like that, that were trying to oppose the gospel. Even though this woman was very sly, she's trying to oppose the gospel by saying a whole lot of truth. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. What she was saying was true. The devil mixes a lot of truth in with his lie, because if you can get people to see some truth, you can bring them in and then they, they can't discern the difference between the truth and the lie. They've seen some truth, and then they let their guard down, and they believe the rest of it. And this is how he does it. Let me give you another example. The unbelieving Jews had bewitched the Galatians into believing false doctrine. You see, this is all part of Satan's plan to oppose Jesus and his gospel by use of devils. Look at Galatians 3 and verse 1. Galatians 3 and verse 1. I used to take more of a uh, uh, metaphorical approach or a figurative approach to this verse, but I don't, I don't think I take a figurative approach to this verse anymore, and I'll explain to you why. Galatians 3 and verse 1. He says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Well, I can tell you who bewitched them. It was the Pharisee types that came in to try to spy out their liberty and to tell them that they had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. This is what Paul's whole epistle to the Galatians is about, is these men crept in unawares trying to spy out their liberty. You can read about it there in the beginning of chapter 2. So it's Jews, the Pharisees, the wicked leaders of the Jewish nation. They had bewitched the Gentiles here, the Galatians in this case. To bewitch means to affect generally injuriously by witchcraft or magic. So to bewitch is to affect by witchcraft. Now you could go down and find some other figurative definition down in the list, but why go to a figurative definition whenever I just showed you that Israel's full of devils, right? And Paul here says that these same Jews that are full of devils are bewitching Galatians to not believe the truth. They are using witchcraft. Of course, we know this happened. We already read about it in Acts chapter 8, right? This type of bewitching is, I think it's literal. Remember Simon the sorcerer had bewitched the people of Samaria? He certainly, I mean, that was certainly literal. He literally bewitched them, right? Well, why couldn't the the uh, devil-inhabited Pharisees do the same thing? Paul warned the Galatians about the sin of witchcraft, like the real, actual sin of witchcraft. Galatians 5 and verse 20. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. It says they won't inherit the kingdom of God that do those things in, in the next verse. How about this? The Ephesians, they were steeped in occultism prior to their conversion. This is everywhere. Satan had really prepared the land and the surrounding lands for the coming of Christ to oppose Christ. Uh, um, Ephesians, Acts, I'm sorry. <laughs> Acts 19.19. 19. Acts 19 and verse 19. I'm winding it down here. I'm just about done. Acts 19.19. 19. It says, Many of them also which used curious arts, that's occultic stuff, witchcraft, sorcery, that kind of thing, that used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God, and prevailed. So these people were deep into the occult, into curious arts. When you've got 50,000 pieces of silver worth of books, you probably have a pretty good hobby there, right? This is not something where you've just happened to, you've read one article on witchcraft or something, and you, you've wondered about it. When you've got $50,000 or a lot more than that worth of books, you know, there's a lot of witchcraft going on there. That was firmly entrenched and, entrenched and established. And Paul warned us in 2 Timothy, Chapter 3, about the likes of men like Jannes and Jambres who withstood Moses with counterfeit miracles, who were doing miracles by the power of Satan. Look at 2 Timothy 3 and verse 8. 
2 Timothy 3 and verse 8. He says, Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. We're not really, Janes and Jambres is not used anywhere else in the Bible, but I think it's very reasonable to conclude that Janes and Jambres were the magicians in Egypt that withstood Moses. But Moses went there and the Lord told him, you know, uh, throw down your staff, it'll become a snake. And they did the same thing, right? And, and make the water blood, they did the same thing, right? They could do a lot of the same miracles that Moses did. So I'm assuming that Janes and Jambres were the names of these magicians that were just not given to us back there, but are revealed in the New Testament under the inspiration of God. So Satan's unleashing of the power of darkness commensurate with the coming of Christ explains why there were so many people possessed with devils in the first century. This really makes it all make sense to me now. Why were there so many devils then? Because Satan was preparing the land and getting them ready to resist the coming of Christ and to try to destroy him. But despite of all this preparation, preparing defenses and offensives, Christ came anyway. He ends up coming despite all the efforts. Look in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, 1 through 14. This is pretty neat. Despite all odds, God's plan just keeps marching on. No matter what Satan does, he's not going to be able to stop it. Luke chapter 2, 1 through 14. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, that is, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Well, that must have been a cold job on December 25th, huh? Out there whenever it's freezing cold with your, out there with your sheep in the, out in the, in the field, huh? No, it was in September when shepherds ab- abode in their fields by night. How many shepherds do you know abide with their flocks out there sleeping under the stars on December 25th in Israel when it's freezing cold and raining? Just thought I'd mention that. Anyway. Verse 9, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So despite all of Satan's machinations for 4,000 years trying to prevent the seed of the woman from coming, He comes right on time when the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem them which were under the law. Now next time I'm going to look at, we're going to look at how Satan was not done. Yes, Christ was born, but guess what he does right out of the gate? He gets King Herod to try to kill him. And he kills all the babies in Israel. So he's still working to try to prevent this Messiah from growing up and becoming the Messiah that is going to bruise his head.